We began last week a sermon series that we're calling Awaken, and we're taking time over the next month for all who are willing to join us as a church to commit to fasting and prayer for the spiritual awakening of households in Medina County. Um, last week, uh, I shared with you, if you were here, a bit of my disappointment as the pastor of our church, which I so rarely have ever had with our church, um, that so few of us had signed up to participate, to pray, and to fast. Um, thank you for, as a church, proving your maturity and your faithfulness again. Um, we have well over a hundred individuals that have now signed up to participate, and it's not too late for you to join us. There's information in the bulletin. You go to a simple website. The website is in there on the graphic. The form takes seconds to fill out, and then you will be emailed a list of 10 households in Medina County to pray for them by name. Whether they are believers in Christ or not, you won't know based on the address and the last name, but you can pray that God would awaken them spiritually. Um, so we are going to spend the next four weeks, this morning and then three more, considering um, testimonies from the life of Elisha the prophet of God's power and God's faithfulness. Um, I want to equip you, even as we consider these real historical events from the life of God and His people, um, that we would be inspired as believers, that we would be even mindful of ways that we can pray for others to become awakened and alive, to see God as He is. I think it's often very easy, especially as Christians or those who come to church regularly who have a, a, a degree of familiarity or humility towards God. It doesn't take a whole lot of knowledge to know God way up high, us way down low. I think it's very easy to be more mindful of the things we're not doing or should be doing, our failings, our inadequacies, our def inadequacies, our deficiencies, than it often is to just be mindful of how wonderful and incredible and good God is. The evil one and the fallen things of our world constantly tell us we're not enough, we need to do different, we need to do better. And hear me clearly, we are clear on this as a church. All must repent of their sin. All of God's creatures, because of the fall, are fundamentally poisoned at their core. That must be resolved in Christ alone. But often, God first gives us a glimpse of how incredible He is. And so I just want to be mindful this morning and the next several weeks of how incredible God is. So this morning, I'm going to tell you a story from the book of 2 Kings about God's incredible provision. The creator of the world is a God who meets practical needs and not little and insignificant needs. The God who made the world meets the deepest needs of His people so that we would trust Him. So before I say to you this morning, you should trust God, which is a fact, I say to you this morning, God provides all of our needs. So the story is told in 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to be in 2 Kings over the next month, considering different stories from the life of Elisha. If you're not familiar with Elisha, he is the prophet after Elijah. Um, if you're familiar with the New Testament, John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus, was said that he would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So there are very few figures in the Old Testament scriptures as significant as Elijah. The man we will consider God's activity through, his name is Elisha. His name means God. El is the Hebrew word for God. God is my salvation. So Elisha is, you could think of him like an Old Testament rabbi. He's the leader of a prophetic guild 
or you'll see this morning in the book of Kings, they're called the sons of the prophets. There were groups of prophets in different towns. Each group had a leader. Now, Elijah was the leader of the prophets at this time in the history of Israel. This is shortly after the time of King David. Basic biblical chronology, you could think of King David, King Solomon, that's 1,000 years before Jesus, ballpark, 1,000 years before Jesus. Elisha is a prophet around 850 B.C., so a little bit after the time of David, for about 50 years. Now, Elijah has a well-known reputation for being a man of God, but the Holy Spirit reveals to Elisha that his master is going to die. So the book of 2 Kings opens with God making known to Elisha that his master, the prophet who speaks from the Lord, the, speaks the Lord's words that he receives, Elisha now knows that his master is going to die. And he is following his master, and his master tries to get away from him and says, I'm going to go to this town. And Elisha says, as surely as God lives, I'm not leaving you because I know you're going to die soon. I'm not leaving you. And he says, fine, follow me. So they go to another town. Same thing happens. Elijah says, I'm going to go to this other place. Elisha's like, nope, not without me. I'm if you're leaving, I'm coming with you because I know you're going to die soon. That happens three times. Now, there's this wonderful transfer of blessing and power and authority from Elijah to Elisha. There's a group of prophets. There's 50 of them. They come to the Jordan River, and Elijah says he must go across. So he takes off his, his cloak, his outer garment, his robe, if you will. He takes it off, rolls it up, and smacks the Jordan River in the river parts. There are several places in Scripture where bodies of water are miraculously parted. This is one that's maybe not as well known. Rolls up his garment, hits the water, it parts. They go across the Jordan River. And now, Elijah makes it known to Elisha that he's going to die. And he says, what would you have me do before I go? And Elisha says, would you give to me a double portion of your spirit? <laughs> it reads to me a little bit funny. Elijah, the man of God, says, ah, that's a really difficult thing to do. <laughs> I guess it would be. It's a really difficult thing to do. However, if when I get taken up to heaven, if you see it happen, then you will know that you have received the double portion of my spirit. So the two of them, only the two of them, go across the Jordan River. The company of the prophets stays on the near side. They go through as on dry ground. They come to the far side. As Elijah and Elisha are speaking, chariots and horses of fire descend from the heavens. The Bible doesn't say this, but this is how I picture it. They begin to swirl around, but they separate Elijah from Elisha. The scriptures say, this is in 2 Kings, you could read it, creates a whirlwind, and up into the heavens, Elijah the prophet gets taken. He doesn't die. He gets taken up into the heavens. And Elisha is like father. He calls him father. Father, I see you! And the chariots and the horses of fire, meaning, I'm about to get my blessing. I can see it. And as it's happening, as Elijah goes up into the heavens, his cloak, remember the same cloak that he rolled up and he split the water with? It falls to the ground. And he disappears. Elijah disappears. I mean, if you're Elijah, what are you going to do? I'm about to go get that cloak. <laughs> that I'm no dummy. God just sent chariots and horses of fire, and he took my master and lifted him to the heavens. And his cloak of authority, his mantle of authority, of power, of anointing, falls to the ground. Yeah, I'm picking up that souvenir right now. So he goes and he picks it up. 
And now, as a demonstration that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is now upon Elisha, he likewise takes the cloak, he rolls it up, and then he goes and strikes the Jordan River. It parts, and he walks back to the company of prophets. Now, this company of prophets, they have a new master, a new rabbi, a new leader. The anointing of God has passed from one to the other. Now, this is where the story begins. A wife of one of the sons of the prophets, you can follow along, 2 Kings chapter 4 if you want, uh, the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cries out to Elisha, and she says, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know how much my husband feared Yahweh. But the creditors have come to take my two sons as their slaves. One of the things I love about the history of God's activity with people, the stories of the Bible. They're not made up. They're not myths. They are stories. They are retellings of God's real activity with real people. Elisha was a man just like you. This woman that comes to him, she didn't live in a world that was black and white. Her clothes also had color. Her hands also felt. Her ears heard. She is more like you than you realize. This is true of all of the history of Scripture because God addresses real people in real needs in real situations. And the God of the time of Elisha is the same God today. So this woman comes to him. You can put yourself in this story. She is now a widow because her husband died. What do we do when there is a death that is untimely? We ask God, why? How could this be? There's a man in our own church three weeks ago had a massive stroke out of the blue, and he passed away over the weekend. If that's your husband, if that's your father, if that's your grandfather, if that's your uncle, if that's your friend, why? How? So this woman cries out to Elisha. My husband is dead. You know how he feared God. He was in the company of the prophets. He spoke for God. He did miraculous things. How could God let this happen? And it's worse. Because now the one who holds my husband's debts has come to me and demanded payment. They're not my debts. And now I must pay, and I have nothing. How am I going to pay? The creditor will exercise his right to take my children so that they can work off my husband's debt. This is a story of provision. A woman at that time, in that culture, there's no such thing as a woman who works outside the home. There is a woman who knows the protection and the provision of her husband. So when she comes to him and says, my husband is dead, she is saying, I have no means of provision. I have no means of protection. How could God let this happen? You know how my husband feared God. And now it's worse. Not only is my provision and protection taken away, how will I provide and protect my kids? Because now they are going to be taken away from me. This is real life. You can put yourself in circumstances and situations that you feel like God has permitted or even caused something terrible to happen into your life. And your response, like mine, is the same. How? Why? This is terrible. Look how bad this is. They're going to take my kids. So Elijah says to her, what would you have me do?
There's no answer. He says, what do you have in the house? What do you have? What resources do you have? What do you want me to do? And what do you have in the house? She says, nothing. Nothing except this little bit of oil. Your servant, she says, has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Now, in the story, we're going to read about vessels. This is just a jar. It could actually be a really small one. The Bible doesn't say exactly. This word is the only time it occurs anywhere in the Bible. It says it's a jar of oil. It's most likely olive oil, not a petroleum byproduct like we think of today. Olive oil. Oil in the Old Testament is very often a sign of God's blessing, God's favor, God's anointing. I think there's a very compelling argument to be made that oil in the scriptures is even a foreshadowing and a reference of the Holy Spirit, of blessing, of favor, of power, of anointing. And all she has is this jar. I think it's probably a small one. It's the only thing of value she has in the house. Remember, she has a need. She has a provision problem. Her husband is dead. The creditor is going to come and take her children. She goes to the prophet, Elisha, help me. What do you want me to do for you? No answer. What do you have? What of value do you have? And she says, nothing. We should always read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the scriptures. Yes, we can pull good moral lessons out of the Old Testament. We can learn about God. We can learn about humanity. Those are perfectly legitimate. We should also always read all of the Bible through the lens of Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all things. I think it's pretty interesting that she is aware that she has nothing. Remember Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Only those who come to God recognizing that they have nothing that God most desires. She says, I have nothing, but I have this little bit of oil. So this woman is in a desperate situation. Then Elijah says to her, go outside. Now, I think this is interesting. I don't want to overread into the details, but come on, God chooses what to put in the Bible, and there's a reason for it. Go outside. The home is the center of her problem. Husband died. Kids are going to be taken. Elijah says to her, go, move, go outside. And then he gives her steps of faith to take, as God often does. Go outside. Now, here are the instructions he gives her. Go outside. Borrow, he says. Ooh, that's a sore spot. It's the creditors, right? The creditors have given money and resource in the past. She has already gone down the road of borrowing, and it's not working out so well. Elisha says, go and borrow, go and borrow vessels, bigger containers. Go and borrow vessels from who? All of your neighbors. Ooh. Mm. <sighs> These are real stories. A real woman is being told by Elisha. Go to your neighbors in your grief, in your despair, and in your need, and ask them for empty vessels. Huh. So I'm going to go to my neighbors. I'm going to make them known my plight to them, my vulnerability. I mean, what a step of humility she has to take, right? You've been in desperate places of need before. 
That's not exactly a time where you want to make yourself vulnerable to others. Raise your hand if you love to ask for help from others. That's what I thought. We don't want to ask for help. We don't like to go to people and say, I am in need, I am vulnerable, I have a desperate problem. And so she has to go, if she will listen to the man of God, she has to go to her neighbors and ask them, I love the way this is ordered, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Let's be clear on that. Don't be going and asking them if you can have some oil. Oil was incredibly valuable. It was um, used in cooking. It was used as medicine. Oil was an incredibly valuable commodity. And this is a story about resource and provision. Go to all your neighbors, make your need known to them, ask them to borrow, ooh, sore spot, ask them to borrow vessels, empty vessels. And this last phrase is fascinating and not too few. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, if you have faith as small as the grain of salt that you put on your food by the hundreds, you got one little salt grain of faith you can say to a mountain, throw yourself into the sea. Go outside. All your neighbors borrow vessels, empty ones, and not too few. So often in our lives, our unwillingness or inability to trust God is the limiting factor. So he tells her, not too few. What a step of faith for her to take. Then the next instructions. Then go in, shut the door behind yourself and your sons, and pour into all these vessels. What are you picturing? She went out and she gathered 10 jars. I'm making that up. She walked around the street, knocking on doors, got some vessels. She and her sons carry them back to the house. He says, okay, next, go back in. Go back to the center and the source of your pain. Go back to your need. I think that's pretty interesting. And pour oil into all these vessels. I don't have great faith, so I'm thinking I'm going to obey what the man of God says. I want to follow the instructions. And he says, pour oil into all these vessels. I'm going to be like, okay, get, boop. because there's not very much in there. And I'm going to pour oil into all these. I, okay. So he says, go back in, shut the door. Interesting. Shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all these vessels. And then he says, when they are full, when they are full, set it aside. When one is full, set it aside. Why close the door? That seems like an interesting instruction. Get your vessels, go back inside, fill up the vessels. When one is full, set it aside. But make sure you close the door first. He tells us why in the next verse. Verse 5, so she went from him, shut the door behind herself, and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. Shut the door. She leaves the man of God now. Who is the one who meets our needs? Who is our provider? Who is our protector? God. So leave the man of God. Close the door on the man of God. God is our provider. God is your provider. God often provides through other people. You get insight through experts and professionals and others. You can get resources from others. You get help from others. 
But God often wants to prove to us, wants to prove to you as an expression of His love for you, He wants to meet your needs. Maybe sometimes God has permitted you to endure a really difficult circumstance where you're feeling alone, where you're feeling isolated. Maybe it's actually God sending you back in to the very place where you feel your need the most so that you can know in your deepest need that you have a Father who loves you and provides And He wants to prove to us His provision so that we will trust Him. He's not benefiting from our trust. We are benefiting from His trust. If only we will trust Him. So the woman goes and gets empty vessels and is told, not too few, muster all of your faith. Open all of yourself to the work of God. He will provide. So go back in, close the door, fill the vessels. When the one is full, set it aside. So she goes back in, closes the door, starts pouring. It's interesting. She's now involving her sons. I think this is consistent with the way God works, with how faith works. So now she's involving her sons. When the vessels were full, now imagine her joy. All the vessels are full. Was the vessel, should she use two hands? Is she right-handed? Is she left-handed? You decide. You picture this woman. She's filling up these larger vessels in this smaller container, just keeps pouring oil. And the first one is full. Imagine her joy. It doesn't take great faith at first to start pouring it in there because she can see the oil in the flask potentially. She knows it's in there. She swirled it around. That's how she knew she had a little bit. So she starts pouring, and it just keeps pouring. And imagine the joy that she begins to feel experiencing and receiving God's provision. Many of you have felt this when God gives to you in your moment of need, when He gives you provision when money randomly shows up, when peace descends upon you, when courage is breathed into you, when wisdom is given that you didn't have. The whole earth is God's and everything in it. God doesn't have a resource problem. And if you are His child, you don't have a resource problem either because your Papa who loves you owns the world. So imagine this woman's joy. She's taken steps of faith. She's humbled herself. And here now God is meeting her need. And the first vessel gets filled. This really happened. What does she say to her sons? Boys, we are loved. We're going to be okay. And it's filling up. And she goes to the next one, and that one fills up. And she's like, hey, come over here. Move this one out of the way. Get, get the next one ready. Bring that thing over here. She doesn't know when the fountain's going to stop. I don't think she poured and then picked it up. Um, I wouldn't. If this thing is pouring out, I'm just like, we're not wasting any of this. I am not turning this thing up until my arm falls off. So her arm is getting tired, so she props it. This really happened. You try holding a pitcher of water like this for how long. I don't know how long it took. Imagine her joy and her excitement. Bring that one over here. Get the next one. Did it take minutes? Did it take hours? I don't know. She's pouring, and these vessels are filling and filling. When all the vessels are full, She becomes aware she's filling the last one, but the oil's not run out. She says to her sons, get more. Pull your shirt out. I don't know. Make a cup with your hands. Put your head back. Open up your mouth. I don't know. Where's the vessels? Get another vessel. Now, this this is a wonderful testimony to God's abundant provision in the intersection of our faith. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel, get another one. And he says to her, 
There is not another. And then the oil stopped flowing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Your faith matters because God is so generous and so good. He will meet your needs when you trust Him. God's ability to meet your need sometimes is inhibited by our lack of faith. So Jesus and his own earthly ministry, there were towns and places he went to, one including the town that he grew up in, that he could do very little there because the people didn't have faith. We should pray and ask God to increase our faith. As you're praying this week for the families on your list, will you pray that God would open their eyes to see Him as the provider, Him as the protector? And would God increase their faith and increase our faith? So all the vessels are full. Get another. Mom... They're all full. There aren't any more vessels. Then the oil stops flowing. She comes and tells the man of God. Imagine what that testimony was like. How many times do you think that dear woman told this story the rest of her life? How many times do you think those boys who were there that day told this story? I was with a a family at a family gathering in Pittsburgh last night celebrating a a 40th anniversary of my dear aunt and uncle and a surprise party for them. We sat around the table after a wonderful meal recounting stories of their life and their marriage and their blessing to people. And so many of the stories brought up the faithfulness and the goodness of God. And there are older people in the family, and there are young teenagers around the table. Imagine how many times those boys told other people. Imagine how their faith was spurred on by them seeing God's provision. I prom well, it's not my promise to give, but you get the idea. I promise you those boys later in life when God permitted them to go through a season of need, I promise you, they reminded themselves, God meets our needs. I have seen it. So maybe the hardship that God leads you through, maybe when He allows you to feel like you don't have the provision you need, maybe He's doing it so that you can see, so your eyes can be opened, so your soul can be awakened again and afresh, that God meets needs If you are his child, he promises to provide for you the most significant things. So Elisha says to the woman, go, sell the oil, and pay your debts. Pay your debts. Does that not ring a bell? to those of us who are aware of our own sin? Pay your debt. God has given this woman a sufficient amount to pay her debt, and it gets even better. Pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Pay your debt and live. You tell me that's not a foreshadowing of Jesus. Jesus is the true and the better Elisha. Jesus is the blessing and the provision of God through whom and only through whom those of you who are aware that you have nothing, you have nothing to provide for yourself. You have nothing you can do to meet your deepest need but this little bit of oil. And if you will trust God, then he pours into your life 
the Spirit of Christ. He gives us the resource that pays our debt so that we can live, so the woman can live and her sons can live, so that all who believe in Jesus will live even if they see death. When I consider this miraculous statement of God's provision, where in the life of Jesus, for those of you who know some of the life of Jesus, what does it bring to your mind where vessels are filled with God's anointing, God's blessing, God's power? Reminds me of Jesus' very first miracle when he's at a wedding feast and there's a need to provide and there's no more wine to give to the guests. And Jesus fills vessels as a foreshadowing of the life and the blessing and the vitality that he would bring. And then later in Jesus' life, Jesus calls out on the last and greatest day of the feast that anyone who believes in him, streams of living water would flow from within them. And he was referring to the Holy Spirit that would be yet given. We all, I think we all, want to know the abundance and the blessing of God's provision. So then gather up all of your empty vessels, every area of your life, and allow God to show you your need. Sometimes he makes it painfully obvious when he takes away your health, when he takes away a relationship, when he lets you experience the consequences of your previous actions. Sometimes he makes you so aware of your need but always he invites us to become aware of our deepest needs and bring the empty vessels to him and to let him fill them. If you are already in Christ, that means you bring every area of your life, every empty vessel, and you allow God to pour in the life of his spirit and you take the steps of faith that he gives you and you will know increasingly the provision of your incredible maker and father. And if you are not yet in Christ, well then your life is the empty vessel. And would you bring your need for forgiveness for reconciliation to your maker, would you bring that to God, admitting I don't have, I don't have it, and allow God to give to you the riches of Jesus that pays off every debt through whom you can live. Because God who made the world and created every last one of us provides for his people so that we would trust him even more. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we, we receive that your word is true. And we share in the rejoicing of this dear woman who was alone, I imagine anxious, afraid, with a broken heart. What a peril to be mourning your husband and to be threatened with the loss of your children. And then to be told to go and humble yourselves before your neighbors and to borrow even more so that she could become convinced, so that she could experience for herself your abundant provision. Father, may we likewise trust you, bringing to you every empty vessel in our life, every point of need, especially our greatest ones. <laughs>
Church, why don't we take a couple moments now and pray um, for the families that you are praying for. If you brought your sheet with you, you can get it out and be reminded of the names. If you don't have it with you or you haven't signed up yet, pray for those who live around you, those in your family, those that don't know Jesus, and pray that God would open their eyes to see him as the provider of the most significant needs. Would you take a couple minutes and pray, and then after we've prayed for a couple minutes, Brian and the band will lead us in worship again. Go ahead and take time and pray. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.